Hello, I'm Matt Ryan and welcome to Script to Screen Birds of Prey. We are so happy to have the screenwriting co-producer here with us today to help us get into the psyche of Harley Quinn. So please welcome to the virtual Apollo Theater stage, Christina Hudson. Hello, I wish I were there in real life with you. <laughs> uh, well, we will for the sequel. <laughs> uh, there is one. Uh, so our, our first question is office, artists often draw on personal experience to incorporate into their characters and stories. <laughs> so which Birds of Prey character are you most aligned with? Harley, Huntress, <laughs> Renee, or Black Canary? Easily Harley. Mark Ma Ma and I joke that between the two of us, like she's somewhere in the middle of our two brains. <laughs> Not good bits of our brains necessarily, but she's definitely there. <laughs> All right, so let's go back in time. So a long time, what was about these comic book characters, specifically Birds of Prey, that made you want to tell their story? You know, I have to give all credit to Margot on this one. She, um, it was her idea to do Harley Quinn and the Birds of Prey. I didn't know all of these characters. I knew some of them a little bit. Um, Black Canary I knew, Huntress I knew of, but I didn't know her well. And then when I heard that she was interested in the Birds of Prey generally, I did a kind of a deep dive on all of them. I just fell in love with them. They're all so different is what I love to each other. Um, obviously there's lots of different members and, and we kind of picked our own selection. Um, but yeah, I just, I think that, such interestingly unique, different, contrasting characters. And I think that's kind of what I was excited about is of putting people together who didn't naturally fit necessarily together. And how, how were you, uh, did you, so you had a lot of good research with the comic books. So you did have a good background for that. A lot of reading. We went to the DC library, which is a very fun, very weird place. Um, just an unimaginable amount of comics and just pulled things off the shelves and just got carried away and left with just armfuls and armfuls of stuff. And that was just the first round. That was before we did anything. That was before we you know, decided which characters or what storyline or what even, the only thing we knew at that point was that we wanted to do an R-rated ensemble Harley Quinn Birds of Prey thing. Um, and yeah, we, we did a lot of the reading first. And then as we kind of honed in on certain things we would do more reading in different areas. Uh, yeah, so, I said, so that was actually the first decision, you wanted R-rated. Yes, yes. That was something that was important to Margot from day one, um, is that she wanted to do, because it's Harley. Harley feels so much more fun when she's off leash. Um, of course you can do Harley PG-13 as well, but she's naturally as a human a fairly R-rated character. Um, so it's fun to be able to do her proud and do her the way she was meant to be. <laughs> All right, so the, the Birds of Prey explores a lot of different themes, emancipation, finding your voice, female empowerment. When you and Margo started on the project together, what were the conversations about how you would approach these themes? You know, we, we actually didn't begin with theme. Um, it's something that I, as a writer, always like to have in the back of my head. I think when I pitch a project, and I always say this to, to writers I'm working with for pitches, is I always think it's good to pitch with a theme and to have a sense of what is this movie about and why is it bigger than what it is. However, I always think it's really important to be open to that changing because I think the themes do come alive as you're writing the project. I don't think, I, I sometimes think you can limit yourself if you go in being certain it's about one thing and then it ends up, I don't know, it just takes on a life of its own. Most of my projects actually the theme has changed pretty dramatically as I've, as I've gone through the process and then at the end you realize that it was always innate, it was always organic, but the thing that you thought was the theme was not the theme and the thing that was kind of always in there, like emancipation was certainly not the theme when I set out developing the project, but over the course of the years of working on it, and there would be moments where people would be like, but what is it really about? Eventually I was just like, I put it on the goddamn cover page because I was like, it's so clear, it's obviously about her emancipation. <laughs> um, but yeah, it wasn't like we set out to tell that story. It just kind of happened organically. Uh, so then, so going back, what were the biggest challenges trying to get the film greenlit? Like even the, even to start the process? We were very lucky. We they. We're excited about it. In the very, very beginning, the challenges were just that there were many other projects. Um, Harley was such a standout in Suicide Squad. Margot did such a great job with that character um, that as you guys I'm sure have read from the trades and stuff, there were a number of other projects that involved Harley. Um, and, and that was kind of always a bit dispiriting to be like, oh God, suddenly they're all springing up all over the place because we were the first one. Um, but we just kind of kept our heads down, didn't worry about it, focused on what we were working on. And, and, and what's funny is again, like it changed many times through development. But the final thing is actually weirdly very close to the original pitch, even though characters have changed and, and lots of different things have changed. Like it, it managed to stay very true to itself. Um, so yeah, we just tried to 
blinker out, blinker out the noise and stay with what we wanted to do rather than being reactive to what was around us. So, so we'll go back to the early draft of the script. You did have an ensemble structure. You had, you know, multiple characters. How, what was your kind of process of trying to like, how am I going to balance all these characters trying to make sure one doesn't get too much time or too little time? Um, I actually thought you might ask me this. So a few minutes ago, I ran downstairs and took a photo of this, which is on my wall. So this was the very first outline I ever did of this movie. It's on butcher paper. Those were all multicolored post-it notes. I had to do it a photo of a photo because otherwise you could read things and there were secrets in there. Um, but yeah, I, I, it was very hard. Like each of those lines is a different character and I had to make sure they all intersected. So there's lots of masking tape going through and it, it was a challenge, but it was also the challenge that we knew from the beginning that we wanted. I didn't want to tell, we've seen a lot of versions of superhero team ups um, where they get together at the beginning, you know, they start meeting each other by the end of act one, they're like, we're in it together. And then they go off on an adventure. And I love those movies. I really do, but we've seen a few of them. And because Harley and the birds of prey aren't a natural matchup, there is no world in which Harley Quinn will ever naturally be motivated to be working with she would call goody two shoes. Um, I knew I didn't want to do a traditional team up like that. I knew I wanted to tell it slightly differently. Um, and that was the way that kind of made sense was taking four separate strands and then finding a way to have them collide. That makes sense. And then, you know, and that we'll definitely get into that later, how you merge them in act three. But we'll start with the, obviously the lead character, Harley Quinn. She's been portrayed as a hero and of an anti-hero, a villain. It must have been kind of fun to explore her humanity while portraying her dark side. How did you kind of balance making her villainous nature while make her likable and relatable? It's all fun writing Harley. Honestly, it's the most fun I've ever had in my life of writing. It's, she's the most fun. And it, it weirdly wasn't hard doing that only because to me, she, like she is all of it. She's an anti-hero and an anti-villain. I love her and I think she's a good person even when she's doing bad things. So her morality to me makes sense. So to me, it weirdly wasn't that hard. And it was funny as we were going through the process, because originally it was truly just Margot and I together in a vacuum, as more and more people would come in, as we'd share it with the studio, as producers came on, as cast came on, as you're getting notes. For, for she and I both, I think, it was always very natural, like what she would and wouldn't do, like what was and wasn't okay with her. Um, because she just has very strict rules about like who she would kill and who she wouldn't kill, like who she would punch in the face and who she wouldn't punch in the face and when it's funny and when it's not. Um, and I think because we both had a, what we felt was a strong handle on that. Um, and because I think we both loved her so much, it felt kind of fairly easy to make her be likable at the same time as doing bad things because we liked her. <laughs> now she also, I mean, she has her own code. She lives by her own rules. Uh, she does break the fourth wall. Mm -hmm. looking at the camera. So the screenwriter, did you have to kind of create your own screenwriting rules to fit into her world? I mean, her rules are that they're, she can break them whenever she wants. So yeah, again, it was just kind of what felt organic and natural, never wanting to do it for the sake of doing it. Um, and I think that was always one of the challenges with the VO in the end. Um, in post when you're trying to fix things. And occasionally there's times when someone's like, can't you just stick in a VO line that explains a thing? And you're like, yeah, but I don't want her to be there as a tool. I want her to be there because she can't hold her words in and she just wants to tell you stuff. Um, but yeah, it, that, that was a kind of tricky balance, but the, the moments of kind of turning, and the, you know, there are some that are on the cutting room floor, but the moments of, of fourth wall breaking always felt just kind of like, well, of course she's gonna say something. She wouldn't be able to not say something in that moment. I did like her opening where she says, I'll tell the story the effing way I want to tell. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, that was actually one of my favorite lines from her. That's me in there since the beginning. Uh, but I did like, actually, I really love how you, the comic book animation, the opening, does pay homage to the comic books. Yeah. Did, did that help you, though, kind of like being able to lay out a backstory in an interesting way, in a very concise way? Yeah, that was, so the animation in the beginning was a very late edition, actually. Um, and it came from, it was the result of kind of testing the movie and, and seeing how people kind of settled in and when they settled in. Um, but it actually, as soon as we put it in, even when we put it in with very rough kind of temp sketches of stuff, it immediately felt right because it allowed people to, to know what they were dealing with. It immediately set up the tone, it immediately set you up with this character who was both sympathetic and ridiculous and crazy and emotional and 
you know, violent, um, all in one go. And it just gave you the grounding in their relationship. I think one thing that, that we realized from testing early is like, sure, a lot of people know and love Harley and the Joker, but there's also a huge amount of people who don't. Um, and we wanted the movie to be really accessible to people who were new to the DC universe. Um, so that helped us the animation a lot. Well, and too, you know, it also does, you also, we're used to superhero movies we talked about earlier, but this is a different type of superhero movie. So it is good to ground the audience. Like you're not getting what you're used to. Yeah, this is not going to be a cool, slick, normal, action-heavy, cold open. Um, this is going to be something different, involving knocking nuns' teeth out. <laughs> wow, that was a great job. The, uh, but you also had the montage sequence with roller derby, breaking the driver's legs, adopting Iena. I'm always a big fan <laughs> of pets. And of course, setting up the huge personal stakes with her breakfast sandwich. How did you want to use the montage sequence to set up, you know, your nonlinear story and kind of your tone? That the montage has always been there since pretty early on, just because I think it it was important to kind of give you the pieces of kind of what she'd been through and how it's a slightly kind of frenetic, psychotic beginning, but it also felt kind of right. One thing that that um, Kathy brought to it that I really loved was the lying to herself, that, that tone of lying to herself. The original version of it, she was presenting it as just normal. Like this is what everyone's breakup looks like, right? You get, you, you know, you do impulse shopping and you buy a hyena. Um, and then the kind of twist that Kathy brought to it, which I loved was this kind of like, she's selling herself, it's all great. And you're like half buying it because she's crazy enough that she might believe it, but also like you're seeing that sadness and that thing that you've seen all of your friends go through of, you know, You've gone through a breakup and you're telling yourself it's all great, but it's really not. Uh, I hope you don't encourage your friends to blow up a chemical plant, though. I mean, not <laughs> yeah. It's interesting to bring Kathy, because that was, that was our next question. I, I loved her directing style. The visuals were amazing. The uh, captured the manic nature of Harley really well. Costumes, the sets, the vibrant. It did feel like that. I also think she did a great job of shooting Harley and the Birds of Prey as complex characters, not as eye candy. Mm -hmm. but, uh, so how did you feel Kathy captured your script visually? I mean, I think, I think you just said it, a lot of it. And I think, I mean, there was such an amazing team on that movie, like KK Barrett doing, again, like KK Barrett on a superhero movie. I mean, how lucky were we? Um, Aaron Benark doing those amazing costumes. Like everything is just unexpected, I think. And I think, like you say, a lot of people watched it and were just like, oh, hang on a second. We're not doing the like booby, sexy, whatever. And it is like so refreshing. And then you get to the end of, if you didn't know it was Kathy, you get to the end of the movie and you see Kathy Yan, and you're like, oh, that makes sense. Um, like, She's not a gross buff. <laughs> not, not that all of gross buffs by any means. But yeah, the, it just is a different approach. It wasn't something I don't think Kathy ever had to think about because it's just natural to who she is and how she would shoot it. Um, but yeah, I loved how kind of bright and vibrant everything was. I think that was really, really exciting to see just also just exciting to see a daytime version of Gotham. That was one thing that, that mm -hmm. I had talked about pretty early on was let's just see the different side of Gotham. You're so used to seeing Bruce Wayne's Gotham and seeing a dark, gritty, and I love, I love all things Batman and I love that. But I also was just like, hmm, what is a bodega like in that city? What is hot summer midday sun like? Um, so it was kind of fun to do that. And Kathy really embraced that and kind of brought the light and the life and the color to that world. It seems like if you're going to do kind of a different story, you want to ground the audience as much as possible, giving that city feel so they can accept kind of the fantasy or the crazy stuff. <laughs> uh, I did also like the animation slides. I thought that was clever, the grievances, the way that Kathy oh, yeah. makes the grievances with the, uh, <laughs> with the actual scenes. Oh, yeah. I the, the actual idea of the grievances was in there from very early, but credit has to go to, we had an amazing assistant editor named Britt DeLilla who did just awesome cool stuff that she started with just as kind of like super temp stuff, but she had such a natural kind of fun design sense of humor that it ended up massively influencing the, for the final look. Um, and I, I loved what she brought to that. All right, so we're gonna start talking about the other birds of prey. Uh, Renee Montoya's story starts with her boss stealing her promotion and her need to break free from the police force, all to the tune of 80s cop movie style dialogue, my wife's favorite part. It was especially interesting how you introduced Renee as a great detective in the sequence when she visualizes the murders. I thought it was a good way to show her. How did you approach her story arc? Um, she was always the first chap, so it was off before it, I mean, you can still feel it now, it's in kind of chapters, but it was actually in, in named chapters before, and the cop was always the first chapter. Um, I've always really loved Renee because she's a little bit more grounded and a bit more like normal. Um, 
but I love that she's smarter than other people. And that moment between her and Huntress was one that I, I love the way Kathy brought that to life. It was very, that was a long night of shooting because she did that all in one take. Like all of those lighting changes are happening in real time. Um, and it, yeah, it was important to me to see that exactly what you're saying, which is to see her intelligence, that she can look at a scene in wherever and else is seeing like broken glass. So there's obviously the shooters were outside because that would be the typical thing. Like actually she's like, no, I've clocked this. I've seen that little things that you can't see that she's seen. I think there's always, I don't know. I, I call it competence porn, just being satisfied watching people be really good at their job. Um, so that was something that was important to me with her. <laughs> And there was, a, there was a nice moment where the other detective, of course, was deferring to her, but the other guy detective wouldn't look at her, only as the man. It was really nice setting up this kind of sexist world that she's re she needs to rebel against. Uh, but let's see. But and I also yeah, we mentioned the uh, on uh, Renee and Huntress. Uh, it's a great way to introduce two characters at the same time. Uh, how did you develop uh, you know the Huntress story arc? Because of all, she wanted to get emancipated through revenge. Yeah, um, Huntress was actually one of the first big pieces that locked in for us that our original, original pitch for this movie was very Huntress heavy, very mafia heavy, um, to an extent where it was like, it almost felt like too much a Huntress movie. And, and now of course she's a much smaller part of the movie. Um, but I think a really important one. And I think the fact that Mary Elizabeth gives that great performance, she comes in early and even though you don't see her for that long, she holds a real presence in that movie. Um, I love her because to me, she's so, Cool. She's Batman, but cooler. I mean, sorry, I shouldn't say that. I love Batman, but a, like very sexy version of Batman, but she's got huge, massive, real trauma in the way that he does. Um, and she's just so intense and motivated by something real and heavy. And then to be able to kind of play within the funnest side of that, they're like, well, what happens if you grow up like that? Do you end up a bit like she is where She's a sweet, good, nice person, but she's grown up with assassins and no other kids around and no other normal life with only this one plan in mind. Um, it was kind of fun to play with like, well, then what happens? I did like her looking in the mirror, not being able to deliver the line, I am Huntress. That was actually really, cause she was, as you said, she's, she wasn't good at socializing. Like she didn't yeah. have the normal upbringing. Uh, so, all right, so Black Canary uh, obviously needs to break free in her own way and find her voice, literally. Uh, mm -hmm. And she also has great moments where she, she fights, fights off the guys to save Harley, but still feeling trapped by Roman, which we'll get into in a minute. How is it for you kind of with her character? Because she is struggling in actually, in a lot of ways, I think the most. Yeah. Great. So did, did, that's how you approached it maybe? Or? Yeah, and I think what was important with her was that she wasn't so much trapped by this, the world around her. Like Renee is very much trapped, I think, by the system that she's in and the under, you know, the lack of expectation and people just assuming whatever, she's an idiot and she's in a, you know, woman in a man's world. With Canary, she was the one kind of holding herself back. She needed to em emancipate herself from her own hesitation and fear and reluctance to get involved, her history with her mum. She's the one that's stopping herself from using her voice. Um, she does not need to be underneath Roman's thumb but she allows herself to be because she's afraid to be who she really is. So that was kind of fun bringing that round to the end and kind of finally giving her the moment where she does use her voice. We went back and forth, there were drafts of the script where she would use her voice every now and then earlier and she she kind of knew she had the power but she hadn't fully embraced it. Um, but where we ultimately landed, which I think felt really right, was just that she'd never really allowed herself, you know, that freedom. Um, so yeah, her emancipation in, in many ways was was the most kind of purely emotional and character driven rather than external forces. Yeah, you shared the scene with us where her, she uh, Harley confesses to Black Canary, uh, you know, that she broke up the Joker, which has a lot of stakes and sets on the parallel path. How important was that scene for you? Because it was actually very funny, but very dramatic and yeah. hit home. It, I mean, the really pivotal scene. What I wanted to do kind of with, with all of the stories is just kind of have glancing encounters between them, ways in which they are impacting each other's lives without really knowing they're impacting each other's lives. Um, so the seemingly harmless conversation at the bar where Harley's really mostly talking about herself ends up being a thing that really hits hard with Canary. Um, but yeah, that, that scene is a funny one because it's like, I find it's silly. One of the few sound cues I really fought for at the end of the movie was the like the squeegee noise when Harley slides across the bar. I just find Margot so funny the way she does that, like head slide in. Um, so it is funny, but 
also just, that was day one of shooting and Margot's emotion when she turns and she admits that they're broken up is so real and so raw and so good. And you don't often get to see that with Harley. And I think that was something that was really important to us from very early on was seeing that emotional vulnerability from Harley Quinn because she's such a, you know, she seems almost immortal when she fights. She's so tough, so relentless and, you know, amazing. So to be able to see massive vulnerability emotionally was really important to us. Um, and then I liked that it was emotional for both of them and they don't, they were both kind of in their own world, separate, not realizing how much pain the other one was in. And the um, reality is if we're going to buy that Canary is going to save Harley later yeah. and become an ally, we need something to, you know, connect them early. Although I think, and I think this is true of all women generally, most women, no matter how like against each other you are because of whatever thing keeps you apart, most women would not let a bad thing happen to another woman. You just, it's like, you just wouldn't do it. Like you see it in, on public transport, if a guy's a to a girl, like someone else will step in. Like there is a natural kind of camaraderie and, and, support that we have for one another that I think it, even if they hadn't, and I, I know what you mean totally. And I think for later on, it is important that she's seen that. But for that moment in the alley, I think, I think it just needed to be a moment where it's like, however much Canary is someone that doesn't like to get involved and doesn't like to get her hands dirty and, and step out of her box and potentially put light on herself. She's not gonna stand by and let that happen. She just innately. Later, you raise the stakes on her, though, because then Roman was going after Harley and Canary wanted to save her. So it was, it was yeah, it was, I don't want to say it was easy to fight off the guys in the alley. It wasn't. But her, she was a lot more pressure put on her. Absolutely. Yeah. The, uh, well, let's talk a little. I'm oh, sorry. I didn't see that. Um, like, we toyed with how close she could get to that room. Like, could she cross the door and hear anything? Like, and it was important, ultimately, that she couldn't get too close, I think, because exactly as you're saying, like, we didn't, we wanted to make it clear that that there was a struggle there and it was difficult. Uh, so actually, this is gonna take us to Black Mask. I think he's a villain, he's creepy, he's self-absorbed, prone to temper tantrums. <laughs> I love the scene where he gives a tour to Canary with the shrunken head collections. But how do you wanna create, capture the Roman character? by ma You made him real and not two dimensional, two dimensional wipe out the world type de villain we see often. So what was your process in try thinking about, I wanna make him real? That was really important, the, the not mustache twirly blow up the world thing. I, I, and again, there are some really great versions of villains who do just want to blow up the world and want to do it for all sorts of reasons that can be wonderful and sympathetic and nuanced. Um, I just liked that it all came from ego. It all came from like his heart ego um, and his need to control the world. And that's the thing that it felt such a natural mirror and a foil to Harley that she is this out like uncontrollable thing. And he is also this, they're both kind of erratic and unhinged. And for him, it's someone that it wants to be able to control everything. She is the most infuriating creature um, that just drives him crazy. And I love that. Um, but yeah, Ewan brought so much to that role. It, 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 it's amazing how much he transformed that part, even in scenes where, like the mask scene that you mentioned, it's not even like he's going off book that much. There were amazing ad libs he did though. But even in the scenes where he's writing lines that I wrote, he does them so much better than I ever wrote them. He just brings just this magic to everything. Every gesture, every every pose he does is just hilarious. Like even in that moment where he's standing in front of the statue and he's in the exact same pose as the statue. He's just great. I love I love him. It was such a surprise. I, I'm a huge Hugh McGregor fan. Um, have been ever since Trainspotting, which was weirdly one of the influences on this movie. Um, so getting to see him play Roman was just magic. Well, it's interesting because you say like this is for an actor thing like when you when you have a well-defined character in the script it allows you to find physical ways to manifest it like his tics and his mannerisms captured what you wrote well but and, like, i mean i cannot i cannot take credit for how much he awesomeness he brought to it he it's just mad like there are just little things he does tiny expressions micro expressions um, to just bring it to life same with same with messina by the way like chris playing zaz Zaz on the page can be just a fairly straightforward kind of henchman bad guy. Um, and every day Chris brought something unexpected and insane and brilliant to that role. Yeah, it's interesting because he's, he's psychotic, clearly, but he's, he's grounded, calm, controlled craziness, as actually one of my students mentioned. Who had a, and it has had a real special bond with Roman. It wasn't just, you know, I'm just, he, I work for him. Yeah. What was the thought process in creating their relationship between Victor Saz and like, uh, uh, 
Right. But I wanted there to be love there, like real love there, like, and you know, whether or not you see it as homoerotic or straight or whatever, like it's, it's just love. And I wanted that bond between them because I wanted it to mirror the bond that eventually is going to kind of build between the women. There was something lovely about it to me just because we so often see villains who are only surrounded by henchmen. Um, who will just do what they're told because they're being paid. Whereas for Zaz, he loves Roman. He wants to protect Roman. There is kind of a real sweetness to their dynamic. And it, and it hurts Roman when, when Zaz gets killed at the end. And it hurts Zaz when Canary betrays Roman. I think that was important was that because Zaz in many ways has to be a proxy for Roman in some scenes because Roman isn't a fighter. Like Roman isn't gonna be the guy that walks into the safe house and fights five women. It was really important that there was someone there that could be that person and not just because they were getting paid, but because they believed and they loved and they cared. Yeah, because I also saw as a Roman, I've never seen this before actually, where Roman would have done anything to protect Zaz too. Like he would never throw him under the bus. Even he's a narcissist, he has his ego issues, but actually did love his his, his worker. Yeah. Um, all right, so I, one, of the, one of the scenes that came up uh, with the students was we have to talk about the Harley Quinn uh, musical number. <laughs> Die with her girls are friends. Obviously you and had experience with that from Moulin Rouge, so that's good for you and McGregor. Uh, so how do you view that scene? Because it actually shows her psychiatry skills and her rational side really well. Mm. At the same time, her crazy side. So how did you want to balance that sequence and kind of give us both ends of Harley? I have to give a lot of credit to my husband for the for the Marilyn stuff. So my husband is the person that reads everything 24 hours before it goes to anyone else. I only give him 24 hours because otherwise it'll be too much work. Um, no, so he read it. He read the very first draft of the very first script, I think it was. Um, he was like, I love it. It's awesome. It, like once you get into Harley being crazy, it's great. But he was just like, you just need to get there sooner. Like be weirder sooner. Um, so that the Mar Marilyn stuff actually used to be on the very beginning. It was on page one originally, um, because obviously the structure was all in different orders. Um, so it was always in that interrogation scene, but that interrogation scene kind of used to be the, the beginning of the movie. Um, and as soon as I, I, he literally gave me that note and I was like, shit, I had two hours and I went and I sat down and I was like, huh. And then it, I don't know how it came to me, but it did. And it suddenly made so much sense. And then of course, when Kathy came on years later, it, it was so perfect because she had a background as a dancer. She would always want it to do a big musical number. Um, so actually that was a big piece of her when she pitched for the job, she did a really cool sizzle reel that used that song and used kind of that footage from the original Marilyn dance number. Um, and it became this very pivotal thing. It must've been fun for you and Amargo to do that too though. Yeah. <laughs> Just actually yeah. physically. It's a well-trained dancer and was fantastic. Like there is amazing footage of them dancing, it's great. Uh, okay, so we had the big break into the pl uh, police precinct scene. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Harley fights off convicts, accidentally snorts cocaine, which was very funny and Harley-like, coming with her rescuing cat, Sandra Kane. Well, let's talk about what struck you about, what strikes you about Margot's as an actress, being she does combines physicality, drama, and humor all at the same time. It's remarkable. She is, and I'm not just saying that because I love her and she's my friend, but everyone on set universally, especially in those days when we were shooting that stuff, you're just standing at the monitor and you're in awe. Cause she can do, she can go from being this lethal, terrifying thing, wielding a bat where you're like, to then suddenly just having a glint in her eye that just makes you pee your pants. And then, you know, a few seconds later being vulnerable and, and emotional. And there are very, very few actors working right now who have that range and who can do, because it's, it's big and broad in moments, but also very subtle and dramatic. Um, it, it's really a, a remarkable thing. And a, 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 I don't know anyone else who can do what she does. And, and it's that you see it on, on set every day, any moment that she's doing anything. And her facility with stunts, I have to say, is remarkable. Like the, all of the stunt team and her, I have to also give a shout out to her amazing stunt double, Renee Moneymaker, who trained her, but also did a lot of the, the doubling. Um, all of them commented how fast Margot learns. It's it's really, really uncanny. She can pick up those sequences. So she's doing a lot of her own stunt work and then pair that with one of the best stunt women in the world in Renee. Um, you just get a magic. Yeah, we interviewed Jay Roach for Bombshell and said Margot is probably the most prepared actress he's ever worked with. Like uh, dramatically, physically, she- Imagine the, the preparation she does. It's staggering and humbling. She works so hard for every scene 
and thinks so much about it. She has binders of stuff and research and she just goes above and beyond on everything. It's incredible. Well, now the uh, one character we haven't talked about is Cassandra Kane. Mm -hmm. uh, so what did you, for the comic book, I believe she was slightly different from my research. So what was the process of trying to adapt her, but also give your own spin, your spin to her? There's a lot of stuff I can't talk about on this one. Um, but I can tell you that she, obviously she is the furthest away. So she is the, the person who was developed kind of the most separately from, from her comic book origin roots. She kind of became her own thing. She really in, in many ways is an original character um, who kind of connects back. Um, but she, she is the one who's most different and, and it began kind of that way. Everyone else kind of was so naturally grounded in their comic book persona, even though they ended up changing in different ways. They, they began so much with the research and the reading and who that was, um, whereas Cassandra was always more her own thing. I really liked how Ella, the actress, played, you know, Cassandra. She's a sweet, innocent kid. You know, the sh uh, she's a shoplifter. And she doesn't seem to mind blowing up the Frieder-looking a-hole with dynamite. So how did you approach her character in that sense, where you, she, like Harley, she has a lot of different dimensions to her. She's a little bit like Harley, and I liked that idea. And I think that's why Harley likes her so much, is that she is a little bit like a little sister to Harley in that she has her own moral code. There are things that she would do and things that she wouldn't do. Um, but she's also an innocent in many ways, as much as she has done bad things. And it was actually interesting in the third act, kind of figuring out what Cass could and couldn't do. Um, because to me, it was important she didn't kill anyone, for example, even though like there could have been fun beats and we played with some at various times of like, if you do the hot potato with a weapon, like what happens if Cass gets it in the end? Um, but we didn't want to put that on her, I think. And that was important, especially in the relationship with Huntress, that, that Cass didn't end up with that emotional baggage that Huntress did um, and that she didn't end up kind of crossing a line too definitively. Now, the big, I like the sister relationship in Harley giving advice. That's one of my favorite parts of the movie. How important was for you that relationship, kind of giving Harley almost a really normal, natural relationship? <laughs> it was really important and really fun. We actually wrote a lot of those rules um, because like if we'd come into scenes and we wanted something like, Margaret would be like, just give me a thing to be saying. So I'd be like, lesson 32. Um, and we just make up ridiculous stuff of like, what would Harley consider the most important thing to hand down to the next generation? Um, but yeah, it was important to me just to see Harley have a sweet, pure relationship. Like we've seen her have romantic relationships um, that aren't so pure. She's had in the comics other relation romantic relationships that are more pure and that are lovely. Um, but this relationship, I think there was something nice about it being its own thing that was inspired very much by um, an old Harley comic called Behind Blue Eyes in which Harley um, ends up with a young kid. And I always found there's something kind of, it was a very different kind of kid, but I kind of liked that attitude that Harley had towards kind of this young person. I also like the idea that Harley gets to see herself through somebody else's eyes for the first time, who doesn't see her as the Joker's girlfriend. I think for so long, she just been defined by that. And by also in the world, like so many people just know, like you go, even people like will say, oh, what do you write? And I say, I wrote Harley Quinn. They're like, who's Harley Quinn? And I'll say, you know, Joker's girlfriend. They'll be like, oh yeah. And she has for so long been Joker's plus one. Um, and I think there was something wonderful about Harley getting to see for the first time herself through these fresh eyes of this kid who has no idea who the Joker is. And it's just like, oh, you're just you and you're cool. And you're that person I saw doing the roller derby and you're awesome. Um, it, it kind of gave her a new lease on life. Now, did you always land on the uh, Harley's lowest moment of losing the apartment, mm -hmm. losing her a hyena, her best friend, you know, Doc betraying her all leading her to solo Roman? Was that always your kind of lowest moment for her? Yeah, it was, there was always a, a, I mean, the lowest moment is what she does actually in reaction to all of those things. So the triggers of what it is, you know, shifted slightly over the years, although they were always largely the same, but it was always, yeah, at the end of act two that she would do the, she would be the worst version of herself that she ultimately needs to emancipate herself from, that she would do all the things that she would prove herself to be and that the Joker always assumed she was, that the world always assumed she was, um, and that then she would need to spend act three redeeming it. It was nice though, because you did give her a moment where you had Doc, who was a really genuinely nice man. So it was a little heartbreaking. But he, he doesn't do it in a mean way, it's just business. I know. <laughs> but it was the only normal person that actually, you know, cared for her. That's why it was so heartbreaking when he did it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, 
Okay, so now, of course, you mentioned earlier, the characters finally merged together. You've had these parallel story structure and they, all the characters merging together, in, you know, in, in the literally the booby trap. Uh, Harley and Renee square up for their last fight. Black Canary kind of finally confronts Victor Saz. Huntress gets her revenge. And Cassandra Kane confronts Harley for selling her out to be gutted, which would upset me too. Uh, yeah. What challenges, though, were we trying to bring all these together in one scene like that? so many challenges it was really hard but also really fun and it was the scene that we knew would be there from the beginning um we margo and i so two of the kind of main influences and it's uh, sounds random because they're very different movies but they're two movies that happen to be for both of us in our top five um train spotting and true romance and in true romance i mean i'm sure you remember in the hotel like the, the third act is everything coming together and so she and i were talking about that and talking about we we started to call it the cocktail shaker because it's where you put all of your ingredients in and then you just shake it happens <laughs> um so we knew pretty early on that that's what we wanted to do um and then i kind of again it speaks to that thing of wanting to approach the ensemble differently wanting to approach the superhero ensemble differently that it isn't going to be they all come together and like great now we work together it's going to be we come together and at you you've ruined my day you killed my sandwich you've been this bag that i've hated for so like all these different pieces and everyone coming in with their own agenda um was was one of kind of the early things that we knew we wanted to play with um but it was difficult because everyone has lots to say that scene was a lot longer um but it's also tough because you're in a small space and and that was one of the challenges of that physical set is it's that room is an octagon it's small and dark and you're shooting the it's just very difficult really really difficult um so it ended up we couldn't keep it as long as we would have wanted to have kept it because it just felt too long to be indoors so that's one thing that as writers i would encourage you all to think about because you don't think about it on the page all the time because it just says interior at the top of your scene and that was five pages back and you didn't think about it but when you stay in one location especially a small interior location it's a lot um so I learned my lesson on that one. <laughs> well, it was great. I mean, and you had some great moments with Huntress. I love the bow and arrow thing when, you know, she gets called bow and arrow, she gets her rage issues. Uh, now you also have the big fight, which yeah. I found interesting because you have kind of a gruesome moments where they're actually killing people, mm -hmm. the stars. You have great humor with Hunt, you know, with Canary, you know, the, the, asking for the hair tie, which I thought was really clever and funny. And sweet moments with Huntress giving the car, the toy car to Cassandra to console it. How about that? Was there a different, a similar problem with that? You're trying to like mix all these ingredients together and make it work? Yes and no, that was more kind of a problem in the edit just because that is one big open space and you can see most of the other areas from every area that you're in. So that was definitely a challenge in that regard. Um, but no, and this was another thing that was interesting is that so in various, but the earliest version of that, we had always called the reverse raid sequence. So it was starting from the top of the building and working your way down and it was in floors and kind of each, each woman had their own kind of fight with their own weapon and their own enemy as you were coming down. And then it was only at the bottom that you had all of them working as a team very fluidly because they began in the safe house at odds. It felt like you needed to earn them fighting together. And what Kathy did, I think really well was she, she kept that in the lateral space. So they're each fighting their own fight in their different corners, but then ultimately they come together. And again, because she has a background as a dancer, I think Kathy really approached this as a dance. And that was kind of how it had always been on the page is it should feel balletic. It should feel like this kind of beautiful, violent dance of these people working together and around each other, um, which I think she managed to do really well on the carousel. And dramatically, I mean, it's all centering around saving Cassandra. So yeah. the, the only thing that really kind of truly unites all the birds of prey is protecting the kid. Exactly. Which is sweet. All right, so the climax has Harley realized that she is free and she is effing Harley Quinn and people should fear her. I, I thought it was touching that she wanted to become a less terrible person, a yeah. model I live by all the time. Slightly uh, less terrible person. Yeah, just slightly ter less terrible. I, I, that's a good one. Uh, and of course, Cassandra and you know Harley blow up Black Mask. What were the challenges of blending this scene? Because this is the client, this is the big moment. I mean, the biggest challenge is that you have a villain who's not a fighter. And that's always really, really tough in a movie like this because you want your big bad to be the big bad. But also, oh, Roman doesn't stand a chance against Harley, like not for a second. So as soon as she could get her hands on him, it would be a problem. So it was very hard kind of navigating the geography of that scene. Um, and I also wanted to give Cass a moment, like, 
cast doesn't kill anyone really but in this moment she obviously does do like a tricky thing but I also wanted it to be a payoff for something that came from earlier with her kind of pickpocketing and, and trickiness um, and a little bit of a teamwork moment between the two of them it's the two of them trusting each other and and kind of relying on one another it's interesting that's an interesting screenwriting thing having to get a villain that can't fight physically having to give them power to explain why they can still wield it or <laughs> it's difficult <laughs> that's why kid helps <laughs> and Ewan had a great expression before the realization that he was about to die was probably the best. Uh, you realize in any other DC yeah, Marvel- I'm just like so grossed out by these people bonding, like, ugh, what's wrong with you? <laughs> you realize any other DC Marvel movie would have cut away from the exploding body, but I like the fact that you, Margot and Kathy, nope, you show us the body parts. Uh, Okay, so now we have the post movie uh, where all the characters end up. Harley takes on Cassandra as an apprentice, which is perfect. Uh, Canary Hunters formed the Brawler Birds of Prey, which was also great. Uh, how did you how did you feel this was capturing all your journeys of your characters? Just kind of each one finding their own space. Honestly, they all felt fairly inevitable. Like it was kind of the only place that they would end up. It felt right for all of them. They've all freed themselves from the various traps that they were in, um, in one way or another. Like it was important to me that Renee quit her job, um, like that it didn't magically get better. Cause it's not gonna, it's not realistic that sure she would arrest everyone from the booby trap and then everyone treats it with respect. Like that's never going to happen. So she freed herself from that situation. Huntress, you know, is free from the revenge quest and now has to find a new quest. Um, so she tried, you know, vengeance for justice and that felt kind of right for her. Cause again, she's not gonna suddenly just become nice and sweet and normal. Um, she's got a lot of rage issues. She's got to channel that somewhere. Um, and for Canary in some ways it's kind of the most joyful cause she's fully getting to be who she was always meant to be. Um, but yeah, I wanted to end it with really the beginnings of the Birds of Prey. Like, of course, the movie's got Birds of Prey in the title, but they only really become the Birds of Prey at the end. And it, it feels right that it's only the three of them. Harley isn't a Bird of Prey. She, she isn't part of that crew. She can come in and out of their lives and she, in the end, was the catalyst that brought them together and made them be the Birds of Prey in this story. Um, but it, would be un, it wouldn't be true to any of the characters. It wouldn't be true of them accepting her long term and she would never stick around and behave herself long enough. She might come in and out and help for certain missions, but she's never gonna be a straight- And that's the thing, there is some trust there. Even Renee said that, I trust you, which I thought was actually a really subtle, nice moment where, you know, especially her saying it of all the people. Yeah. She's the most by the book of the three, Birds of Prey. Uh, so, well, speaking of origin stories, we went back to being, let's talk a little, uh, I have a question about your origin story. Uh, how did you get started as a screenwriter? I dived into a vat of toxic chemicals. No, I was a development executive in London. I started kind of at the very bottom. I was the sandwich getter. And then I was a reader at Heyday Films um, who made the Harry Potter movies. So my beginnings were just reading. And I would always, always, always recommend that for anyone who wants to be a writer is I would read two scripts a day and write coverage on two scripts a day or read a book a day and write coverage on a book a day. And it was just a really good habit to get into of just like churning things over. I then became, you know, worked my way up from assistant coordinator to junior, junior executive at a company called Focus Features in London, um, which was wonderful. I developed the movie Hannah. Um, and that was where I really realized I, I like story in a way that I didn't understand that I did before working with David Farr who came on to to rewrite that original script was one of the most like gratifying satisfying experiences because we just got in there in the weeds with him he was such a great collaborator um so yeah I was a very hands-on creatively very hands-on development executive at Focus and then in a, a company in New York for a few years um and the thing that I always loved was working with writers and working with story and then eventually I wasn't very happy at that company in New York. So I started writing on the side. I wrote a very dark, twisted kids book um, that I mostly did to be funny. It was in rhyming verse and involved killing lots of small children and children killing their parents. Um, because it was weird and dark and funny, people sent it around and it ended up getting in the hands of a book agent who called me and said, thank you for your submission. I'd like to rep you. And I said, I don't know who you are, but great. Um, and that's, that's how I ended up leaving that job and moving out here. Um, I became a writer thinking like, maybe I can write more kids books. Um, and then I got lucky and while my green card was pending, I had 90 days, couldn't work, couldn't really interview. Um, and so I, I spec'd a script, um, a psychological thriller called Shut In um, that ended up giving me a career, thank God. It ended up being a terrible movie, but it got me a career. <laughs> Uh, so you created with others, uh, Margot Robbie and others, the Lucky Exports Pitch Program. Uh, the program's goal is to create opportunities for female identifying writers to gain experience 
needed to enter in the studio and franchise jobs. What has that experience been like for you, helping these kind of emerging writers? It's been wonderful. I love my writers. It was, it's been a very, very, very gratifying experience. It's been a lot of work. Um, I approached Margot and the Lucky Chap company. Um, I approached them about it probably two years ago now. It was something I really believed in, really wanted to do. It felt like such an achievable. The numbers in the WGA for working feature writers are so bad. They're so heavily skewed male. They're so unbelievably heavily, heavily skewed white um, that I was like, we can make a difference with just six people. And I didn't want to be over ambitious. I wanted to do something that we could really do and stick with. Um, so yeah, we put together this program. We self-funded it. We picked six amazing writers um, who worked their asses off. And we had amazing guest speakers come in. It was a month of very hard work in a writer's room. Each person kind of brought their own idea or log line or just title and we took it from that nascent phase all the way through to a fully developed fully developed pitch and also movie so that when we were pitching these movies to these studios we could say like this isn't just a shiny 16 minute pitch like I've been in the room with these writers we've developed everything we know every scene we know every beat um and they were amazing they were superstars and one of them ended up being a tv project um which is in development now which is fantastic it's based on a her true story in some way. So it was too big for a feature. Um, and then the other five, which were feature pitches, we took out um, just before COVID, thank God. Um, and we managed to sell all of them in, in one go, which was very, very exciting. And now all of them are kind of working away with the studios and yeah, enormously proud. And I think they all have big careers ahead of them. Uh, so what advice would you give to like younger women screenwriters, especially today, uh, trying to Right. <laughs> I mean, my advice for all writers always is read, write and save, like read constantly, write constantly. It's one of the only jobs you can do in this industry that you don't you don't need anyone else. Like if you want to direct, you need a bunch of other people and you need some money and you need friends and you need a camera. If you're a writer, you can write on a napkin. You can write on the back of an envelope. Just constantly be writing. Um, don't give up when you write your first spec and it's getting some traction. Don't just sit back on your heels and see what happens with that one. Move on to the next one. Just keep generating. I think that's a really, really important thing that a lot of, of young writers forget. Um, and, and for the female writers, be ready and have thick skin because it is it is hard being a female writer, particularly if you want to get into the traditionally male spaces. It's so stupid. They're not male spaces. These aren't movies for boys. Men and women like action movies, um, but they have been traditionally skewing male and considered male um, and it can be tough and it, you can feel outnumbered. Um, but yeah, just roll up your sleeves, keep going and, and write what you love. If you are a woman and you love writing big explosions and action movies. Like there are plenty of women who like watching that and there are plenty of men who like watching that and you should just keep writing what you want to write. All right, so we're going to bring my, uh, the student producer of Script to Screen, Gina, on the screen with us and she's going to field some questions from our audience. Hello. Hi, Gina. Hi. Um, first of all, just thank you so much for being here. We're really excited about this event. Um, so the first question is from Catherine Caracillo. Um, one of my favorite moments is when Barracuda by Heart kicks in towards the end of the film. Did you write those kind of musical moments into the script itself or did they come in later? Almost all the musical stuff came later. There's Bumblebee I wrote very much with music in mind. Most of those cues are in the script. This one, I don't think there's very few. In fact, I can't think of any, apart from obviously the musical number, I can't think of any that was on, on the page. Um, so yeah, all credit to our amazing music department for that. Um, the next question is from Demi Arnold. She asks, um, how did you decide what traits and histories to keep from the comic books and what to reimagine or change? Some of it is my decision. Some of it doesn't get to be. Um, there are places where you're part of a bigger universe and you have to kind of play and play nicely with your toys and share. Um, but with the central birds, with Canary, um, Huntress and Renee, it always just generally felt organic having, cause there's so many different iterations of these characters already. So it would just be about reading all of the, all of the comic, well not all of the comics, but as many of the comics as I could and all of the different iterations that I could and finding the core traits that felt so integral to who they were. Um, and so much kind of like the defining, the defining qualities that made me love them as a fan. Um, and then trying to stay true to those while also giving them their own life and, and, you know, making them feel like fresh characters. And kind of along the same lines, um, Christine Mutin was asking if there was anything that you had to fight for against the studio's wants or demands for the film. Honestly, Warner's were awesome. I, I had a pretty dreamy experience on this one. Like the toughest thing in theory was it being R-rated. Um, 
because that was something again that Margot pitched them way way early on and it was before Deadpool had come out I would say as soon as Deadpool came because we that was the main thing that drew me to it was the idea of doing the girls together and getting to do R-rated I was like yes and there was some resistance but then pretty pretty early on in our process Deadpool came out and did fantastically and and that resistance then dropped so yeah great um, and I know earlier we talked a little bit about Doc's character, but um, Cassandra had a question expanding on that. Um, she said, uh, Doc's betrayal of Harley at the end of the second act was heartbreaking and surprising for audiences. Why was this change in Doc's character motive important to showcase in this film in Harley's journey? It's really, really a hard one. And it wasn't always there um, because I did like the idea of the pure relationship, but I think it felt important because it, it wasn't out of character for Doc. It wasn't a big change because for him, it was just business. Like he isn't just saying that when he says that he means it. And I think that was kind of important to realize that everyone in this world, including your tertiary characters has their own agenda and their own life and their own struggles. Um, and everyone is kind of doing their own thing and just trying to get by. Like Doc is in his own kind of trap, just like they are. Um, and that was him taking care of himself. Cool. Um and then somebody asked, there are many sequences where men are being punched in the throat by Harley. Was this a deliberate decision to write in these actions? If so, did they serve to expand upon Harley's own voice and silencing a male-centric narrative? That, that would make me sound so intelligent. So I'm gonna say yes. No. <laughs> no, I think a lot of it is just about like way that people fight when, when you're smaller and you're less physically strong, you have to find clever ways to fight people. I think that was one of the awesome things that 8711 and Chad Stahelski kind of brought to the mix is always looking at ways in which a smaller a smaller fighter can fight a bigger fighter. Like you go for vulnerable spots, you go for the ball shot, you go for, <laughs> you go for things like that. Um, but no, I'm gonna pretend I did and it was all about science. <laughs> right, let's see. We also kind of already talked about the um, diverging storylines, but Vanessa was wondering, how did you decide on this non-chronological -chron structure for the movie? What maybe influenced your decisions? A little bit, um, I don't even know. I was about to say a little bit train spotting and um, true romance, both just having non-traditional structures. Um, but no, neither of those, are, it's not that they're non-chronological, they're just non-traditional in their structure. Um, honestly, it just happened fairly naturally from the beginning because I wanted to tell each of their stories in kind of their own time. They were in their own worlds and that included their own timelines. Um, so I think it kind of felt natural to do it that way. I guess, um... We always end with the same question for our script to screen Q and A's. Um, and so since we're an academic institution, we'd like you to be professor for a moment. And if you were to assign um, one movie for the students to watch to study screenwriting, what would it be and why? Oh man. I mean, I've just said them so many times. So obviously I think train spotting and true romance are among the best written screenplays ever. Um, yeah, I mean, I, those are two of my favorites ever. I've just finished rereading for the billionth time um, Birch Casting the Sundance Kid, which is obviously boring because if you if you guys haven't read that, you're nuts. Um, so I'm sure everyone already has, but William Goldman. <laughs> um, and I would say there are, the, the main thing I would say just advice wise is always be doing that. Don't, don't think that's something you should do at the beginning of your career and then stop. Even when you've been writing for a while, you can always learn things, even if you've, again, read them a bunch of times, like I've read Butch Cassidy and the Sunlight's Kid so many times, but I was in the middle of writing something and I was struggling with something and I was just like, I'm just gonna go back to it. And I opened it up and literally within two pages, I was like, that can completely solve the issue that I'm having on act two of whatever. And it, it transformed things and freed things and just be inspired by other people's writing. And there are, there are people who are masters of this art and, and going back to them will always, always, always help. Um, but yes, train spotting, John Hodge, amazing. Awesome. Well, that actually concludes our Q and A. So we definitely want to thank you, Christina, for coming and joining us virtually. Yeah. Yeah. Of, of course, we do want you back in Santa Barbara in the Pollock Theater. Yeah, very we're, much. Enjoyed we're that. allowed <laughs> and safely there. We've had any of your films, and if you just pick whatever you want, we'll screen. And thank you so much for coming today. Thank you for having me.